But we see Jesus has a very clear message for his church. And, and he has had one for each church thus far, right? The words of the Lord Jesus Christ to his church through his angel. Right? And here he's communicating to the church at Philadelphia. And this letter is very distinct from the ones we've seen before. Uh, up to this point, you know, apart from the, the, church, the persecuted church in Smyrna, he, he's looked at each church and he said, I really like this about you, but I don't like this so much. Or he said, I just really don't have anything good to say. We saw that last week with the church at Sardis, the dead church. Right? I'm really concerned about you, and we've got some things we need to correct. There's some repentance that's going to have to take place. And here we come to Philadelphia, and there's no, there's no, there's no mention of correction. There's no call for repentance. This is, for all intents and purposes, a faithful church. If, if my greatest fear is that we would be the church at Sardis, my greatest desire as a pastor is that we would be like the church in Philadelphia, that, that, we, that Jesus would be able to look at us and say, not, not a perfect church, right? There's no such thing as a perfect church, but that we would be a faithful church. The Lord Jesus Christ would look and evaluate us and say, I want you to hold fast. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. And so we see his message here. And, and again, the city of Philadelphia right, was relatively young compared to the other churches that we've looked at thus far in these cities. Right? It, was, it, was, it was founded in, in uh, 189 B.C. Uh, so it's, it's really, you know, last week Sardis was founded in like 1300 B.C. Right? So an ancient city in comparison and, and, and we, we know, again, because we have a, a city by this name, it's the city of brotherly love. <laughs> I, I, irony, isn't it? <laughs> Philadelphia and brotherly love just don't seem to go together. Uh, but this is, this is what we see, that, and, and this is where the, church, the name of that city comes from, is this old ancient city, about 25 miles southeast of Sardis, uh, that dead church. And it was known as the gateway to the east. It was, it, it was, on a, it was a pivotal key location geographically, right? It kind of separated the east from the west, uh, so Greece from Asia. And, and there was a great deal of culture that went through this little city of Philadelphia, right? And, and so uh, what we see here is this little church, and I say little because we see it in the text, right? It, it was, it, Jesus says, I know that you have little power. Right, so this is a small church with not many resources, and yet it lies right here in the heart of this very key location for the spread of the gospel. And so Jesus has a, a message for his church. Now, although it's, it's a key location for the spread of the gospel, it's a difficult location to exist as a church right, because there's not very many of them. And they're, they're overwhelmed by the culture around them, right? So the Greek, the Greek culture and the culture from Asia on both sides creeping into the church. And, and the truth is, we don't really know how this church began. Uh, we, we don't know when it was started. We have no biblical record of, of anyone from the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we do know this, because it, because it was on that major trade route on the east-west uh, connecting to Ephesus, where Paul had his ministry, most likely, that's how the church was founded. What we see so common in the early church is that Christians, as they would go, would take the gospel with them. So those Christians from Ephesus who were traveling to Philadelphia for trade would take the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they would share the good news of Jesus as they went. And the gospel spread all throughout Asia while Paul was here teaching and preaching in Ephesus, hundreds of miles away. This is the way in which God intends the gospel to spread, is it not? He, he intends for his people to go and to take the good news of Jesus with them as they go. Right? And, and that's what was happening here. And so the church at Philadelphia most likely started as someone in, from Ephesus went out on their, on their business and they took Jesus with them as they went. That's a good reminder for you and I, is it not? As you go this week, right, when you go to work, when you go to school, as you go out into our community who, who desperately needs Jesus Christ, take this good news with you. Take the good news. We're going to celebrate this morning the Lord's table. We're going to see a clear picture of his death, burial, and resurrection and reminded of his sufficient saving work. Take that good news with you as you go. The church at Philadelphia exists for that purpose. <laughs> and, 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 and 
unlike the churches we've seen th- so far, right? Some of them had a short lifespan. Right? You know, remember Jesus said, if, if, you do no, if you don't correct these things, I'm going to remove your lampstand. I'm going to shut you down. Some of those churches lasted less than 100 years, right? Some of them, you know, 50 years, right? And they were gone. They were here, and then they were no more. The church at Philadelphia continues on for 1,200 years. That's remarkable, right? This, we're talking about a church that began in the first century that went almost up to the Middle Ages, faithful in spite of persecution and the gospel. It, it was a continual light for 1,200 years, sending the good news of Jesus Christ out. Faithful church. And, and the Lord is going to use them greatly. And this morning, he wants to encourage them with his message. And, 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 and he's going to start by identifying himself here. Right, so notice how Jesus addresses the church in Philadelphia. The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. The words of the Holy One. Now, so far, every time Jesus addresses a church, he's alluded back to the first chapter in that vision that John got of the Ancient of Days. And those, those images and those pictures were primarily one of judgment, over the, remember, you know, sword coming out of his mouth, eyes of flaming fire. But here, there's no sense of judgment in Jesus' introduction to the church. He says the words of the Holy One. This is certainly an allusion to the, the just identifying himself as the Messiah. Right? The, this, this goes back to Isaiah. Um, <laughs> numerous times in the Old Testament, the Lord's promised Messiah is identified as his Holy One. In Psalm 1610, it says, For you will not abandon my soul, talking about the the Messiah here, or let your Holy One see corruption. So this is a a look, when when Jesus identifies himself as the Holy One, he's communicating to this church that what? I am God's promised Messiah. the the, the, The one who would come and save and rescue and redeem. Now, that's key, and we believe it's key, particularly here in Philadelphia, because there was a large Jewish population. And so he's going to communicate to this church in terms that they would understand the, the, with these Old Testament allusions. Right? This, is, this is the way in which Peter identified Jesus in, in, um, in John chapter 6. John six sixty eight. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. What's what's Peter saying? You're the Messiah, right? You're the one we've been looking for. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one that God has promised. And as the Holy One, Jesus is utterly set apart, holy, pure. He is the only one capable of accomplishing this redemption. He can do what you and I cannot do. He's the Holy One and the True One. In fact, Jesus identifies himself in Revelation by this name in chapter 19. Uh, In verse 11, it says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. Capitalized there, this is the name of Jesus Christ as he's coming in all his glory. He is the Faithful and True One. True having the idea here of one who is genuine, one who is real sincere you know we 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 tend to in our culture we we get tired of fakes and phonies right we get tired we're we're just looking for for something of substance and can i tell you this morning that jesus christ is genuine that what he says he will do who he is is who he is and he's not he's not going to show you one thing and do another jesus is the true one who you can count on and and what he promises he performs this is what jesus has said from the beginning in john 14 6 he said i am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father but by me i am the truth right so not only genuine but there is no other truth as the holy and true one there is no other way there is no other god Jesus alone stands as our hope when it comes to salvation, when it comes to eternal life. The holy and true one who has the key of David. <laughs> now, this is a strange, strange term for us and a strange phrase. And 
to the Jewish mind, they immediately would have thought back to Isaiah chapter 22. Right? And we're not going to take time to, to go back there, but in, in Isaiah 22, we have a reference to someone who has the key of David, who has the authority to open the palace, right, to let people in, to have fellowship or presence with the king, or to keep them out. And, and there was a man who was over, who had the key, and he didn't do his job very well, and he abused that power, and God cast him out, and he put a man named Eliakim over the, the, the palace, and he gave Eliakim the key of David and said, Eliakim, I'm going to give you this key. You have, to who you open the door, it will be open, and to whom you shut, it will be shut. And so they would have immediately thought back to Isaiah chapter 22 and thought, what's the key represent? The key represents authority, and the key represents access. You with me? Some of you, some of you have a key to this church, right? You, you have a key, you have access. You have authority. We've entrusted you with that power. And you can come, and you can go, and you can let people in, and you can keep people out. Does that make sense? Right? <laughs> so this is the, the key of David here is, is a key. When we talk about David, we're thinking about the, the Davidic kingdom, the, 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 Messian, the kingdom of God itself. And Jesus says what? I have the key. I have the privilege, I have the ability of opening and closing the door, of giving access or preventing access to the kingdom. And he identifies himself in this way to this church. And, and it, it's very important here because he wants to remind them of, 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 of who they are in Christ. And he wants to encourage them that, that regardless of the, the, the difficulties that they face and, and regardless of the persecution that they hear, no one can prevent them from entering into his kingdom. Right? This is a, a word of encouragement to his people. That's the purpose here. Right? So, again, nothing negative to the church. This is normally the point where Jesus would say, I know you and I don't like this very much. Right? But here, he, he has nothing at all negative to say. And, and so, this is altogether a message of encouragement. In verse 8, when he says, I know your works... We've seen that refrain over and over again, right? To the church at Ephesus, he says, I know, right? You, you love me, but your love has grown cold, right? And to the church at Thyatira, he says, oh, I know you. I know your works. I know the, I know the sin that's, that's prevalent in your church and the church at Sardis last week. I know you, right? You have appearance of life, but you're dead, right? Jesus sees the heart. He sees what you and I do not see. And here, as he's communicating to the church, at Philadelphia, and he says, I know you. It's really a, con <laughs> they have to be kind of struck with fear at this point. This is the sixth letter, so they have, they have read all the ones before them, and they're thinking, man, what's coming? <laughs> you know, what, what's Jesus going to say to me? But there's nothing here. He, here, Jesus is saying, I know your works, and you're doing them for the right reasons, and you're doing the right things. Wouldn't that be nice to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant. This is what he's communicating. Now, as we say that this morning, you, you need to listen up. Jesus says to you, I know you. I know your works. He knows why you're here this morning. He knows why you serve. He knows why you do what you do. He knows your heart. He doesn't just know the actions, and, and believe me, he knows your actions as well. Right? Nothing is hidden from him. Right? Sometimes we kind of gather in church, and we put on our Sunday best, and we just kind of put on this picture like, man, we got everything together. And, and we all know that's not true, right? I mean, we're all a mess, and we're all, but there's things that you have going on in your life that you don't want anybody to know about. And, and the truth is that you can put on that facade for a long time, and, and I'm not going to know, and, 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 and your friends aren't going to know, and your church family's not going to know. Your husband and wife may not even know. But Jesus knows. He knows. He knows what's going on in your life and in your heart, and you can't hide that, so... Why not this morning just be open and honest with the Lord Jesus Christ and deal with the sin that is evident in your life today? Well, here Jesus is commending this church, and he says, I have, verse 8, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. What's he doing here? He's encouraging this church, right? He's, he's saying, the one who has the key, the one who has access, the one who has authority has just told them, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. What does that mean for them? That means that 
regardless of what they're facing, access into the kingdom of God cannot be denied to them. That, right, and, and these just reinforces the precious promises that God has given his people, right? As his chosen people, right, we are saved and secure and kept by God, that we are wrapped in his hand and no one can rip us out, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's what, that's what he's saying here. I've opened a door, access to my kingdom. No one can shut that. No one. And, and we know according to the very next verse that they have enemies there within the city. Right? You, you look down at verse 9 and it says what? I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not. They lie. I will make them come and bow down before your feet. Right? They have opposition here. Right? They, have, they have those who are by their heritage, they are Jewish people, and they're trusting in their heritage, and they're trusting in their good works to get them into God's kingdom. And God says, that's not the way you come, right? We, we don't come based on our good works. We don't come based on, you know, I've, I, I'm an American. I'm a, I've grown up in a Christian home. We come through Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. And, and so here, you know, these these. You know, this is Jesus' kind of pet name for these people, the synagogue of Satan. These enemies of the church are scoffing at these followers of the way and saying, there's no way you're going into the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying what? They can't close the door that I've opened for you. I have the key. <laughs> and what I have opened, no one can shut. And I think the most important thing for us this morning when we look at this church at Philadelphia is to ask the question, what is it that stands out about them? What is it that Jesus likes about them right well that's what we want to know right there's no there's no correction no call for repentance and so what does jesus notice that he says i really like this because right? if we can grab a hold of that then we can say that's what we should be like as a church right all right i've lost you <laughs> okay here we go this is what jesus likes we see it very clearly in verse eight i know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Here's what Jesus likes. You have little power. What? That doesn't make sense, right? I mean, we would think he, he would say what? You're, you're strong. You're mighty. You're a force for the gospel. He doesn't say that. He says you have little power. And he likes this. This is a commendation. He's observing their works. He says, this is something that's good. Now, it's not that they're little, you know, they're weak spiritually, but they are weak numerically. <laughs> they're weak materially, right? So this is a small church with very few resources. And Jesus says, here's what I really like about it. You guys are weak and you know it. You know it. Right? There's, a, there's a humility exists here in the church of Philadelphia where they understand that this, this kingdom life and this gospel call is something that they are inadequate for in and of themselves. And this is really, please hear this this morning, this is really the start of the Christian life. Right? In, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Right? So entrance into God's kingdom, entrance into eternal life begins, as you understand, your poverty of spirit. In Romans 5, 6, Jesus said he died for those who were without strength. Dear friend, you and I have no ability. We are incapable of doing anything to make ourselves acceptable to God in and of ourselves. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough. You can't go to church enough, be baptized enough, right? You can't do the right things to get yourself to God. That's what those of the synagogue of Satan were trying to do, right? I'm trusting in my heritage. I'm trusting in my works. And Jesus says, that doesn't cut it. Oh, but the, the church at Philadelphia says what? We are weak. I can do nothing, right? So when it comes to salvation, I can do nothing. And so I fall on my face before the Lord Jesus Christ, and I ask him to save me. And that's where I experience life. When I come to the end of myself and I trust wholly in the work of Jesus. This is the way God works, not only for salvation, but this is the way God works in service as well. 
<laughs> on Wednesday nights, we've been looking, kind of walking through the book of Exodus and looking recently at, at, at Moses and this encounter at the burning bush. And God has called Moses to go back into Egypt at 80 years of age and deliver his people out of bondage and slavery from this evil, wicked Pharaoh. And Moses, and you know, in this encounter with God, simply says what? God, who am I that I should do this? You got the wrong guy. I can't, I can't speak. I'm a failure. I've blown it before. I'll blow it again. God, get somebody else. And the Lord looks at Moses and says, no, you're, you're exactly who I'm looking for. You're exactly who. Man, that's good news. God can take a man who has blown it, and he can use him to accomplish his purpose. And if you... And if you've really blown it, you don't have to raise your hand, right? But, but you know, right? You know spiritually you have, you have made a mess of your life. You know what? God can still use you. This week at our quiet time, if you use the word of life quiet time, we've been in the book of Judges, looking at the life of a man named Gideon who, who God calls to deliver his people out of the hand of the Midianites. <laughs> Remember what Gideon said in, in Judges chapter 6, verse 15? Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. What's Gideon say? I'm nobody. God, use somebody else. I can't do it. And what does the Lord say? And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. That's all that was necessary for God to accomplish his purpose. He didn't need a great man. He didn't need a mighty man. He just needed a man who was available for God to work through. A weak man who recognized that in and of himself he could not do. Is this not how God works? Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is the foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Why does God choose to use weak? Why does God choose to use not, not many wise, not many noble? Why? Because when God works in this way, who gets the glory? He does. He does. And that's what God wants, right? He wants to, his, his, his glory is going to fill the earth. You know, we can become really puffed up and think, man, if, if God can use me to do great things and, and if, if, if some of you kind of said, man you know, god didn't look down and think boy i just really need that guy on my team <laughs> you know he, he never looked at even any of us and thought i can't accomplish my mission without him we're weak and foolish according to worldly standards and yet god can i look at this little church here and, and I, I imagine that they feel very alone a small group of believers in this big city surrounded by opposition, being persecuted. They probably feel alone. They probably feel inadequate and incapable of the mission that God has called them to. You ever feel like that? You ever just think, man, <laughs> there's nobody else. It's just me. God, I, I can't. I'm the only one in my place of work who, who, who knows you. There, there's nobody else. They, everybody else despises Christians. They despise, they despise your word. There's nobody but me. What am I supposed to do here? Oh, God can use you. God can use you. Sometimes we just feel like, man, I, I don't have anything to offer. I can't, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I don't have this talent. I don't have this ability. What good am I? And God says, you're exactly who I'm looking for. You know, many times God calls us to do things that are outside of our comfort zone so that we'll trust in him and not in ourselves. Right. Yeah, I shared this with you many times. This is not my comfort zone. It's not my comfort zone to stand in front of people and, 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 and speak. It's just not. And that's what God has called me to do. And, and <laughs> I've learned that as long as I trust in him, then I will see God work. And I'll see him move. Then he can, he can work in ways that I can't begin to think or imagine. Brothers and sisters, God can use you. 
He can use you. He's encouraging these brothers and sisters here. And despite their weakness, notice what he says. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. They may be small, they may be weak, they may have limited resources, but they are faithful. They have all that they need for life and for godliness. God has given them his spirit and his word, and they are, they are recognized by Jesus Christ here as what? Doers of the word and not hearers only. This is the people who say, Lord, we love you, and people know we love you because we keep your commandments. This is the way that Jesus identifies his followers, is it not? This is how they will, you, they will know. They'll know. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, according to John 14, 15. Are you a doer of the word? Do you, now I, again, right? These were not a perfect people. These were people who failed and struggled and fell, and yet their desire was to be faithful to the word. And to do that, we've got to put ourselves under the Word, and we've got to put ourselves in the Word. Right? If we're going to be doers of the Word, then we've got to place ourselves under the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. And we need to be in the Word of God for ourselves. And then we've got to take that extra step and do what? Actually put it into practice. Here's what I know. As we gather here today, the Spirit of God is going to speak to you in some way. If you're one of his children through his word, the Spirit of God is going to work and speak, and he's going to call you to action, right? Because we don't preach merely for information, right? We preach for transformation, right? And God wants to accomplish a purpose in his people. And so you're going to be left with a response this morning, and you're either going to obey or you're going to disobey the word of God. And here, Jesus recognizes his people and says what? I like this about you. You are you have obeyed my word. And you've been faithful. You have not denied my name. In the face of opposition, Jesus likes it whenever we recognize him before others, right? When, when we acknowledge him, he says, I'll acknowledge you. You know, because of their dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ, because of their obedience, and because of, because of their faithfulness, the church at Philadelphia has some amazing privileges. God has opened up a door for them that no one can shut. That's access to the kingdom. But we also saw in our scripture med this morning that an open door means opportunity. Opportunity for evangelistic outreach. Right? This is what Paul equated with in, in Colossians 4.2. He said what? I'm praying that God will open a door. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, Paul said, I'm going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me. What, what's Paul saying here? There's a door that's open for the gospel to go forth, and I'm not leaving until it closes. Paul, or the Lord Jesus Christ says to the church at Philadelphia, I have set before you an open door. You have an opportunity for gospel outreach. And they're going to make use of that for 1,200 years. You know, I believe, right? Not only did they have access to the kingdom, but they had the ability to bring others through that door. And that's true for you and I as well. We live in a community that is hurting. You know, Babe prayed that earlier as he, as he just lifted up our church. And, 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 you know, we're surrounded by people who are hurting, who are suffering, who are, who are turning to drugs and alcohol and sex to, to, to kind of wipe away their pain. We have an open door. We have, we have an opportunity to reach out to people and say, look, you're, I know the answer to your pain. I have the answer to your problem. And that answer is Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that all the hurt and all the suffering goes away, right? We're, we're not putting up empty promises and saying, if you just believe and trust, then everything's going to be perfect. Oh, but we have a Lord and Savior who walks with us. And, and <laughs> he gives us all that we need through the hurt, through the trials, through the pain. In fact, as we finish out this section here, Jesus is going to offer his people these faith-building promises. It's going to bring them to the end. Notice 
very quickly here because we're just kind of summing them up in, in four parts, right? So uh, verse 9, he says, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, right? I'm going to make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Again, these are talking about Jewish unbelievers who have rejected Jesus as the Messiah, still holding on to their heritage, holding on to their works, and they're persecuting Christians, followers of Jesus. And Jesus says what? I will take care of your enemies. <laughs> right, that's promise number one. Right? <laughs> this is a posture of a humble and defeated. They're going to come and bow down before you. Again, there's allusion back to Isaiah, several chapters talking about the opposition, the enemies of God's people bowing down before them. Uh, the, the clearest New Testament reference I can think of is Philippians 2.11, where it says what? Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? There is coming a day when all God's enemies will kneel before him. And they will recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah. Right? And so he's, he's promising, I will, I will take care of. And I believe here for this church in Philadelphia, that means some of these persecutors are going to turn and trust in Christ. They're going to bow the knee and they're going to come and follow Jesus along with them. What, a, what an encouragement to this church who's been given an open door. Right? We saw that with, the, with Saul of Tarsus who became Paul, right? Persecutor of Christians, right? antagonistic to the way Jesus shows up and Paul becomes this man on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus is promising to his church. I'm going to take care of your enemies. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to protect you. We see it in verse 10. You have kept my word about patient endurance. I'll keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to those who dwell on the earth. Those who dwell on the earth is a clear reference in Revelation to all unbelievers. All those who do not know Jesus Christ. And, and it's a reference to the judgment that is coming upon them. And here he just simply says, I'm going to keep you from that judgment. Now there is a lot of debate over this particular verse. And we're deep into our time here. So we're not going to dig into that. All I want to do is say that regardless of your position on what you believe this time of trial is, just have grace. right? Because there, there's no way we can be 100% certain about what Jesus is referencing here. Right? It, he's talking to it. <laughs> A specific people in a specific time saying, I'm going to keep you from a time of trial. We have no record of that historically. We don't know what that is. Many people believe this is referring to the great tribulation that Jesus references in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. And that's certainly possible. What we do know is this. Jesus is offering here encouragement and saying, I'm going to keep you safe. I'm going to protect you. Remember what Jesus prayed in John 17? It's the only other place in the New Testament we see this exact same phrase. John 17, 15, Jesus prayed, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You know, they're, they're going to be in the world, but Jesus is going to keep them safe. <laughs> He's going to protect them from the temptation, from the evil, from the sin around them. And so here's a promise to this church. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to protect you. What encouragement here. And then verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. So promise number three, I'm coming soon. You say, you Christians have been saying that for a long time. It still hasn't happened. No, but it can happen, right? It, it, we believe that the, the coming of Jesus Christ is imminent, meaning it can happen at any time, right? The people in the scriptures believe that and live that way. And Christians throughout history have believed and lived as if Jesus could come back at any time. And you say, well, What's he waiting for? Well, Peter tells us that he's, he, it's not that he's not keeping his promise, but he's patient, right? Not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Right? We see the long suffering and the grace of God in withholding his return. But he is coming. He's coming back. And, and he says, because I'm coming back, oh, dear faithful Christians in Philadelphia, keep on. Hold fast what you have. Continue to, to trust in me and depend on me and not on yourselves. Continue to obey my word. Continue to hold my name faithfully. Don't quit. Don't give up. As Bruce Fry would say, keep on keeping on. Right? This is what he's calling his church to. He's calling them to keep on. Not, and there, there's no hint of a loss of salvation here. Right? Don't, don't, don't read anything into that when he says, so that no one may seize your crown. 
Right? This is merely talking about reward when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Apostle John wrote in 2 John 8, he said, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Live your life in such a way that, that when Jesus Christ comes back, you'll experience the fullness of the reward. That's what he's saying. Hold fast. Don't quit. Don't give up. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? Particularly when you feel all alone and you feel inadequate for the task at hand, there's a temptation just to give up, to quit. And, and, and Jesus says, don't quit. Don't quit. Hold fast. Keep doing what you're doing. And then verse 12 is this beautiful promise. The one who conquers, right? The true believers, those who know Jesus Christ, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. All right, so last promise, promise number four, is I'm going to give you a permanent home and an eternal family. Permanent home. This would have spoke volumes to the people in Philadelphia. They lived right on a fault line, and there was constant tremors. And in AD 17, an earthquake wiped out their city. They had to flee, and it wasn't until Tiberius rebuilt the city they were able to move back in. They were constantly in fear that their home would be destroyed. And here Jesus says, you don't have to be afraid about your eternal home. I'm going to make you a pillar in my temple. There's a, there's a sure and steadfast eternal city that belongs to you as my people. And I will write my name in the name of my city in your new name. What's he saying here? You have a new identity, right? You're identified now with God. And your home is with him. And your Lord is him. Everything about you in Christ relates to him. He has written his name on you. And, and, and as his people with his name written on your life, what does that mean? You, you know, my, my, my children are Bensons, right? They carry my name. And so as they go out into the community and, and they go places, they carry the Benson name. And so what they do reflects on the Benson family. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, you carry the name of Jesus with you. And where you go and what you do says a lot about Jesus to people. And so let us lift high the name of Jesus. Let us exalt him with our life. Right, this is comfort beyond imagination for his people. These promises that he gives. It's a comfort to your heart this morning. Here's the thing I know. I know that there are those of you here who are hurting and who are suffering, much like the people in Philadelphia. Now, you're probably not experiencing the kind of persecution they were experiencing, but you know what it is to suffer. And Jesus says to you, don't quit. Don't give up. I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. I will keep you and you have a home with me you have a home with me this is not the last word for you so there may be suffering in this world and there may be hurt and there may be pain but jesus says i'm with you hear his promise this morning and keep on don't quit oh dear friend is that promise yours do you have the promise of an eternal home? If I could ask it this way, if you were to die today, do you know where you would spend eternity? Do you know if you would be in heaven or you'd be in hell? Would Jesus say, <laughs> you have a home with me? You see, the only way that you can be sure of that is if you have put all of your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've come to the end of yourself and recognize that there's nothing you can do to save you and you've called out on Jesus you know, perhaps today he has opened up a door for you, a door of salvation into his kingdom. When somebody opens a door for you, what, do you, what must you do? You have to walk through the door. Would you walk through that door this morning, calling out on the Lord Jesus Christ, recognizing your sin, recognizing that you can't save yourself? It requires you to humble yourself. You can do that right where you sit. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
you know, as we come to the Lord's table this morning, let us come humbly as his people, remembering the cost of our sin. Let us come acknowledging our disobedience, confessing our sin. Let us, let us acknowledge this morning those areas where we've not been faithful. We're going to just take a moment, right? We're not going to have a regular invitation. We're going to take a moment and just give you opportunity to pray and to, to prepare your heart to come before the Lord's table, remembering the precious promises of the Lord Jesus Christ that he has given us. Right, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He said, I am coming. We are going to continue to shout and proclaim this good news until he returns. Remembering that Jesus said in Mark 14, what? I'm not going to drink of this cup again until I drink it with you in my kingdom. Jesus is waiting to celebrate with you his finished work. Let's pray.